Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is that you're watching this. This is episode 90 of Left Side of the Isle. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next nearly half hour, I'm gonna be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. As always, comments, questions, reactions, whatever, tidbits, suggestions, ideas, they can all be sent directly to me. Hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. That's the email address. And if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be the address will be up over here somewhere a couple of times during the show. You can get the email address directly from there. I do read my email. I do answer my email. I'm a little slow about it sometimes, but I do do it. Uh, And just one thing that if you send me email, please include something like left side of the aisle or, you know, your cable show or whatever, so that I know it's not spam. Anyway, with those uh, uh, traditional introductions out of the way, on to the show. First thing I'm going to do this week is something I wanted to get to last week, but just simply didn't have the time for it. Um, It is time here now for one of our occasional features, the Hero Award. The Hero Award is given as occasion arises for doing the right thing. The winner this time is Senator Tom Harkin. He's an old-style, progressive, populist senator out of Iowa. He was the only liberal or so-called progressive who voted against that supposed budget deal, that, that way to dodge the mythical fiscal cliff that I was talking about last week. Uh, He accurately called it a very bad deal, including for some of the reasons I talked about last week. Uh, Senator Harkin, in fact, described the fiscal cliff as a manufactured crisis. He said that the deal benefited the wealthiest Americans at the expense of those who could afford it the least. He mocked those who wanted to, I'm quoting him here, redefine the middle class as those making $400,000 a year, when in fact that represents the top 1% of income earners in America. He also noted that the tax bill makes uh, tax benefits for high income earners permanent, while those that are geared more to uh, people of modest means, they're only extended for five years. Quoting him again, this agreement locks in a tax structure that is grossly unfair to middle class Americans, one which provides permanent tax assistance to the wealthy and only temporary uh, relief to everyone else. Maybe now we are all believers in trickle down economics. I'm not. All the other liberal heroes voted for this, uh, voted for this thing. Uh, our own John Kerry did. Sherrod Brown did, Barbara Boxer did, all of them did, even the supposed socialist Bernie Sanders did. Now, it was pretty much the same in the House. A handful, a couple of progressives voted for it, but the overwhelming, uh, voted against it, rather, but the overwhelming majority voted for it. In fact, uh, Raul Grijalva and Keith Ellison, who they are the co-chairs of the House Progressive Caucus, they both voted for it, as did the entire Massachusetts delegation. The bottom line here is that for all these progressives, for all their words, for all their perhaps actual convictions, they were not going to vote against a deal brokered by a Democratic president. As is all too often the true, uh, all too often true, party mattered, mattered more than policy or the public. Tom Harkin stood against that flow, and even if you, for some reason, disagreed with his vote, and I don't, But even if for some reason you did disagree with his vote, you would have to recognize the conviction he showed uh, in favor of justice for the many over the privilege of the few. And for that, Tom Harkin is a hero. All right, we're going to move on from there to uh, one of our regular weekly features, the outrage of the week. Uh, We're going to start with Taco Sid. This is a Mexican restaurant in uh, in West Columbia, South Carolina. It's been serving up what you might call tacos with a side order of racism. Check this out. Check this out. Now, in case you didn't make this out, the t-shirt here reads, How to catch an illegal immigrant above a drawing of an old-fashioned box trap baited with tacos. And in case you didn't get that, The lettering is in white, red, and green, which are the colors of the flag of Mexico. 
It turns out not only do employees, this is, a, this is an employee in the picture, not only do employees wear this t-shirt, they sell it to customers. We like to tell ourselves that racism, that uh, various forms of bigotry, they're, they're all in the past, that we are a post-racial society. In fact, the election of Barack Obama was supposed to prove that. Instead, it only served to point up how far we have yet to go. Or have you forgotten this? And this? And this? Oh, oh, wait, wait, no, wait, wait, no. That's not racist. Oh, no, no. In fact, there's a guy in New Jersey who will tell you that. He put up this picture as part of a Halloween display at his store attacking the, the new health law. And he insisted it was simply a personal political statement and declared that this has nothing to do with race. Right, of course it doesn't. And a hot day in July has nothing to do with the sun. In fact, he claimed that those in the community who objected to this display were trying to run him out of town, which is, that's always the logic of the bigots. It always is. They have the freedom of speech. That's freedom of speech. I can say whatever I want. But you do not have the freedom of speech to object to their bigotry, because if you do, then they are the victims. They are the ones whose rights are being trampled. They can say whatever they want. You can't. Yes, but it's about freedom of speech, right? Yeah, it's all about freedom of speech. Yeah, and I suppose this is just another case of freedom of speech. Oh, had you forgotten about Trayvon Martin? Well, uh, in case you had, maybe this will remind you. The, uh, these were, were gun targets that were sold after his murder. But I tell you what, let's get back to restaurants uh, for a minute here. Because, unfortunately, racism is on the menu of a lot of them. Last spring, researchers at North Carolina State University released the results of a study of servers at chain restaurants, which they did in North Carolina. That survey revealed that more than one-third of those servers, in fact, nearly 40 percent, admitted to discriminating against African Americans, admitted to giving them poorer service at least some of the time. Uh, over half of these servers said that they had seen some coworker give poor service to, to a black family or a black person. And what's more, nearly 90% of these servers uh, reported having observed or taken part in racially bigoted conversations among coworkers. This is a kind of you might call it subtle bigotry, it's sort of semi-invisible bigotry. It's kind of, you know, you just give somebody poor service. You treat them more poorly. Sometimes it's based on some unspoken assumption where you don't actually realize you're doing it. Uh, worse, it can be cases where you justify it to yourself. You're saying, oh, it's because of how they are. It's okay for me to do this, to treat them differently. That kind of, again, semi-visible bigotry, because you're not supposed to know that you're getting worse service, but that kind of bigotry is an everyday experience for black Americans. And of course, you know, it's not just race. Remember that the Taco Sid bigotry was against Latinos. And we shouldn't have to remind ourselves that bigotry against Arabs, who are now often portrayed as all being hook-nosed terrorists, are, uh, that kind of bigotry is all too common. But okay, this is what got me. This is what really provoked this particular rant. It's another form of bigotry. The House of Representatives opened the year 2013 by letting the Violence Against Women Act die. The Violence Against Women Act, which was supposed to provide legal protections for victims of domestic violence, was passed in 1994. It has been renewed twice since then, each time with bipartisan support. The Senate renewed it early this year, but the misleadership of the House refused to even bring it up for a vote. The result is the bill has died. It doesn't exist anymore. And now the whole process has to be started all over again in the new Congress. Now, the Senate passed its version of the bill back in April, I think it was, again, with bipartisan support. 
This bill included provisions to extend the protections of the act to three groups who are victims of domestic violence who are not covered by the original act. One is uh, about 30 million um, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transsexual people, LGBT people, uh, included undocumented immigrants and some Native American women. And you know, it was that last provision that apparently was the real holdup in the House. See, right now, tribal courts have jurisdiction uh, over an assault against a Native woman by a Native man on tribal grounds. They do not have jurisdiction if that assault is by a non-Native man. That's for state and federal law enforcement, who are often hours away and often lack the resources to respond effectively. The result is, as, as Senator Pat Leahy put it, non-Native uh, American men who abuse Native American women on tribal lands are essentially immune from the law, and they know it. One in three Native American women has been raped or has, has experienced attempted rape. The rate of sexual assault on Native American women is double the national average. And in 86% of those cases where Native American women were raped, they were raped by a non-Native American man. Those men who are essentially beyond the reach of the law. That statistic is precisely what Senator Leahy was talking about. It is precisely what that provision of the law was intended to address. But the House wackos wouldn't approve of that because of some paranoid delusion that allowing tribal courts a little greater authority on tribal lands was giving up American sovereignty. And so they would rather they would rather declare their indifference to the safety and health of women. They would rather declare their, their preference, both for letting those Native American women remain victims and millions, scores of millions of other women have legal protection stripped away from them. They would rather declare to the world their utter sexist disdain for the health and safety of women rather than surrender their thumb-sucking fantasies. Racism, sexism, bigotry against blacks, against Hispanics, against Arabs, against women, against more, it remains all too common. And meanwhile, at least one House of Congress is being bossed around by anti-intellectual anti buffoons who celebrate their own lack of social conscience. And that is an outrage. By the way, there's a quick footnote to this. Taco Sid used to have four locations in South Carolina. Now they have the one. Uh, as one observer said, since it's safe to say the owner isn't going out of his way to attract an authentic Latino clientele, it's not exactly hard to see why. Okay, and from there, actually, because it leads right into it, our other regular weekly feature, the Clown Award. The Clown Award, given for meritorious stupidity, this week's dishonoree is Pope Benedict XVI, who will always and forever be known to me as Cardinal Ratzinger. On Sunday, January 6th, he declared that Roman Catholic leaders must have the courage to stand up to attacks by intolerant agnosticism. These intolerant agnostics with their own dogmas are trying to push religion out of the political debate, he says. Catholic bishops must have the courage to stare down this intolerance because the church cannot stand for this kind of intolerance. This came less than three weeks after his annual Christmas address to the Vatican bureaucracy in which he described homosexuality as a choice and denounced same-sex marriage as an attack on traditional families, one that denies God and destroys the very essence of the human creature, which apparently in his mind is determined solely by whether you pee standing up or sitting down. This followed his annual peace, and yes, you can assume the word is in quotation marks, his annual peace message in which he labeled same-sex marriage as a threat to world peace. So I'm sorry, did he say the Catholic bishops need to stand up to intolerance or for intolerance? Now the Pope was probably cheered by the news that the goppers in the House of Representatives have chosen to use the occasion of the adoption of rules for the new Congress to commit to sinking even more money into defense of the 
incredibly misnamed Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, they also, these rules also add the declaration that this is, expresses the view of the entire House, which it obviously does not. However, let the Pope take what pleasure he can from that, because increasingly and happily, the world is just not listening. In addition to the election gains in, in, the, US bill this, uh, in the U.S. this fall, uh, there are hopes to pass a same-sex marriage law in Illinois, and in fact, a couple of other states are possible. The Constitutional Court in, in largely Roman Catholic Spain just upheld the constitutionality of the same-sex marriage law that got passed in Spain. The British government has announced that it's going to introduce a same-sex marriage uh, for, for Great Britain in 2013. And in France, the president there is to submit his Marriage for Everyone plan to Parliament next month. And back at home, there is increasing confidence among advocates for justice that the Defense of Marriage Act, which has already been found unconstitutional by 10 different U.S. courts, will actually be struck down by the Supreme Court when they hear arguments about it in March. Still, however, none of those gains change the fact that Pope Benedict XVI, Cardinal Ratzinger, who sits atop a church that regards homosexual acts as intrinsically disordered, is a clown. And we are going to take a break. And we're back, as you can see. All right, we're going to move on to something else now. I just got to tell you about it's official. It is official. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, announced on January 8th that 2012 was the hottest year on record in the lower 48 states of the United States. These records go back to 1895. 19 of those 48 states recorded their hottest years ever. Three quarters of them recorded their first, second, or third hottest years ever. 46 of those 48 recorded one of their 10 hottest years ever. In fact, the coolest state, which was Washington, uh, still had a warmer than average year. How hot was it compared to other years? This hot. You can see how that year, this year 2012, compares to the other hottest years that we have recorded. It was a year of blistering spring and summer heat, with July being the hottest month ever recorded in the, in the contiguous United States. It was a year of tinderbox fire conditions, raging wildfires, the worst drought in several decades, and the worst storm ever to hit the Northeast and uh, the Mid-Atlantic states. Now the thing is, remember, that's just the United States. Okay, that, that's just the United States. Uh, globally, it's going to be a little bit better. Uh, the actual statement won't come out till later in the month, but it's predicted that for, world, for the world, that 2012 will be about the fourth hottest year on record. It's worth noting that all 10 of the 10 hottest years on record have occurred within the last 15 years. But the fact is, by one short of measure, uh, one measure, sort of measure, that uh, even apart from that, 2012 proved itself to be a record-breaking year. The extent of Arctic sea ice is something that um, climatologists watch. It grows, the extent grows and shrinks as the seasons change, as you'd expect. But what climatologists have been watching is how the yearly minimum, when the ice is at its smallest extent in the height of summer, uh, has been declining over time. This year's 2012's minimum shattered the previous record, which was set five years earlier, shattered it by an area about the size of the state of Texas. Arctic sea ice is melting faster than any model projected it would, so fast that summers may see the Arctic ice free in just a couple of decades. What's more, Greenland's ice sheet also saw previous melting records shattered in 2012. One researcher called it a Goliath year. He said it's the greatest melt since satellite recording began in 1979. In fact, Greenland is now losing ice at a rate five times faster than it did in the 1990s. And on top of that, new studies show that contrary to what some had thought and some skeptics claimed, Antarctica is also losing ice. 
And all of this makes up, all of this ice loss makes up at least part of the reason why, according to a UN, re uh, UN report, ocean levels are rising 60% faster than previously thought. Now, here's the thing, though. Here's a question for you. All that stuff I just went through, how much of that had you heard about? Sure, how much of that have you heard about? I mean, I got all this from easily found news sources. I didn't have to dig in the bowels of some bureaucracy in order to find out this information. But the thing is, I will tell you one place where I surely did not find it. I did not find it on network TV news, and especially not on the Sunday morning talk shows. In 2012, those Sunday morning shows, like, you know, Meet the Press, Face the Nation, those people, those Sunday shows in 2012 spent less than eight minutes on climate change. And that, that means eight minutes total, all of them together in the entire year. And when they asked about it, who did they ask? Well, over half the time, it was some media figure. Uh, nearly a third of the time it was a politician, and in every one of those cases it was a Republican. These shows have not asked a scientist about climate change in four years. Now, the nightly news shows were better on all of these fronts. They uh, quoted some Democrats, they quoted some scientists, and they generally acknowledged the scientific consensus about global warming. But that better is only by comparison. The three nightly network shows, ABC, NBC, and CBS, their nightly network news covered global climate change, a grand combined total of less than one hour in the entire year of 2012. In fact, remember that report I just mentioned about uh, record-breaking Arctic ice, sea, uh, sea ice loss? On both network and cable news, Paul Ryan's workout routine got more than three times the coverage that that fact did. Considering that we are now at a place where a report prepared for the World Bank says that unless the world acts quickly and dramatically against global warming, that by the end of the century we will face an apocalypse, an apocalypse, an apocalypse marked by monstrous storms, the collapse of entire ecosystems, with the displacement, suffering, and death of hundreds of millions of people amid rampant disease and a widespread famine. Considering that that is the future, that current best scientific knowledge says that we will have created for ourselves unless we change our ways and fast, that kind of media malfeasance is completely and totally unforgivable. All right, one last thing. One last thing I'm going to get to. Uh, we're going to go to our occasional feature where we go to things that are not really political, and this is called And Another Thing. Now, for centuries, tales of sea monsters like the Kraken, giant squids with their tentacles pulling sailors and even whole ships down under the sea have been told in hushed tones. For some time, scientists actually doubted that such creatures even existed, these giant squids. In fact, even until relatively recently, most of the knowledge of them was based uh, on carcasses that had washed ashore or on a couple that had gotten entangled in nets or lines that got dragged to the surface. It was only a few years ago that the first still images, the first pictures of a giant squid in its natural habitat, which is far below the surface of the ocean, were actually obtained. Now, for the first time, first time ever, scientists have obtained video footage of a giant squid in its natural habitat. And by the way, you want to know what a giant squid looks like? It looks like this. And close up, it looks like this. Uh, the squid caught in the video is uh, 19 feet long, uh, 9 feet long, rather. But giant squids have smaller tentacles, and they have two very long tentacles, which they use to pull in food. This squid is missing those two long tentacles. If it had had them, it would have been about 26 feet long. The research team used a smaller squid to attract uh, the giant squid, used it as bait. But they also, for the first time, did something. They used a lure that mimics the bioluminescent glow of a jellyfish in order to attract the squid's attention. See, they did this because giant squids are, they are, they are visual predators. They're, they have an eye that's bigger than your head. So 
it's also a reason why they've been so hard to track because you go down there with your bright lights and your submarines and your bath escapes and whatnot. They see the light and they run away. This time, researchers found a giant squid just over 2,000 feet below the ocean surface, tracked it down to nearly 3,000 feet before they lost it in the darkness. Members of the team say they were amazed by what it looked like, said it was stunning and beautiful. One said it looked like it was sculpted from metal and it would change color from silver to gold. Now, the video has not been released yet. It will be released on January 27th. It's going to be shown on, Discovery on the Discovery Channel. I don't know about you, but I'm going to be watching. All right, that's it, because I, but I have a little time left, about two minutes, I guess, so I have enough time for this. Um, it's something that, uh, just some thoughts for you, to, for you to gather. I'm going to read something, and then I'm going to tell you who wrote it. And you, maybe you should try to guess who wrote this. Okay. Land, as before said, is the free gift of the creator in common to the human race. Personal property is the effect of society, and it is as impossible for an individual to acquire personal property without the aid of society as it is for him to create land originally. Separate an individual from society and give him an island or a continent to possess, and he cannot acquire personal property. He cannot become rich. So inseparably are the means connected with the end in all cases that where the former does not exist, the latter cannot be obtained. All accumulation, therefore, of personal property beyond what a man's own hands produce is derived by him by living in society, and he owes it on every principle of justice, of gratitude, and of civilization that a part of that accumulation goes back again to the society from whence the whole came. This is putting the matter on a general principle, and perhaps it is best to do so, for if we examine the case minutely, it will be found that the accumulation of personal property is, in many instances, the effect of paying too little for the labor that produced it, the consequence of which is that the working hand perishes in old age and the employer abounds in affluence. So who do you think wrote that? Do, 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 do. The answer is, who was Thomas Paine? Take that, all of you right-wing loonies who are going the wisdom of the founding fathers. Thomas Paine was a socialist. All right, that's it for me. I'm done. I'm out of here. I will see you next week. Uh, you have the best week you possibly can. Enjoy your time. Enjoy yourselves. Enjoy your family. Peace to you all. Bye.